Okay, let's um, turn in our Bibles now back to the Lord's Prayer. I'm glad that Joshua is sharing today because Jesus prayed this prayer in Israel. I'm not exactly sure precisely which mountain he was on when he when he prayed the Lord's Prayer, when he asked us to pray the Lord's Prayer. But uh, we certainly have that context of of Israel in the background uh, of, of what was going on and what Jesus is asking us to pray for. Um, let's just pray. Father God, we ask you to bless your word. Um, Father, bless the speaking and hearing of your word. Have mercy on us. Lift us up by the power of your Holy Spirit that we could hear hear you, God, and and, um, be moved by you according to your good will and purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm just going to read one verse. Let's read it all together. It's Matthew chapter 6, 9. Okay? Let's go. Let's read it all together out loud, okay? This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is our fourth sermon on the Lord's Prayer, and we're still at um, verse 9, uh, but we're going real slow through it. We're, we're taking it slow because we believe that Jesus gave us this prayer for a good reason. He said, this is how you should pray. And so we want to take that seriously. We, we pray for these things, and many of us, I don't know, you not maybe too many of you, but when I was a kid, we used to pray this prayer every morning in our school and uh, before we did anything else that day. Um, but it's good to understand what it's about. What does this actually mean? And I mean, hallowed be your name. How many people use the word hallowed? Do you know what that word means even, right? Uh, some of these things we kind of do in a, in a routine form. Um, let's understand what we're praying for. A couple of weeks ago, um, we talked about the address, our Father in heaven. And so it's good to keep that in mind, that when we pray, hallowed be your name, whose name are we talking about? We're talking about the name of our Father in heaven. And we talked about how that is the Father of Jesus Christ himself. And through him, it's also, um, God is also, God, the Father of Jesus Christ is also our Father. We come to share in his We get this permission to share in the relationship that Jesus had with Father God. Um, So let's talk about this, okay? In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches us to ask for about six or seven things, depending on how you understand them, okay? Six or seven different petitions. And we think about prayer. Prayer has a lot of different dimensions to it. Sometimes we're just adoring God. Sometimes we're confessing our sins. Sometimes we're giving praise and thanks. Um, But I think the heart of prayer, as Jesus taught it here, is to ask, to ask for things. When Jesus said, this is how you should pray, he then went on to say, our Father in heaven, and then ask God for these six or seven things. Um, So that's the heart of, 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 of prayer, I think, is God's children asking God for things. There's other dimensions to prayer as well, for sure. And we remember who God is. That's very important. But we're asking God for things. So what things should we ask for? I think there's a priority here. I think that the petitions that Jesus asked us to pray for uh, reflect the core priorities and values of Jesus' heart. And so Jesus is inviting us to, as we pray these things, to have those same priorities on our heart that Jesus himself had on his heart. Um, There's a saying that your your prayer is your life, and your life is your prayer. And so this is not meant to just be something that we pray verbally, say the words out loud, but it's also something that we live. We let these priorities characterize our life and guide and govern our life. That's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't just pray for his Father's name to be hallowed, but he lived for that. Everything that he did was toward that goal and toward that that aim and that end. It was the great passion that drove the life of Jesus. It's also the great passion that drove uh, Paul. When Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, he said, uh, So whatever, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, but all for the glory of God. Everything that you do, whether you're, you're eating or drinking or anything, it's all for that goal, for that purpose. It's ordered towards that, that end. Um, <clears throat> I think when we think about praying in Jesus' name, 
You know, like in, in James, in the book of James, James tells us you don't have because you don't ask God. When you ask God, you don't receive because you're asking with the motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Well, we think about prayer and what are we supposed to be asking for? And what does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? Jesus said that when we pray in his name, God will hear and God will do what we ask, whatever we ask in his name. So I think part of praying in Jesus' name is to pray in a way that's informed by Jesus. And part of that is to share in his heart's desires, his values, his goals, his purposes, and his priorities. We just studied the Song of Songs, and we we learn about the deeper level of intimacy that's available for the church as we walk in partnership with the Lord. Um, And we have a deeper fellowship with Jesus. We pray in his name for these things. Okay, so um, let's break this down a little bit. Let's think about what does the word hallowed mean? The word hallowed, um, people use it around Halloween. There's Basically, people use that word in the Lord's Prayer and then for Halloween. And there's not really a lot of other uses that people give to that word these days in our, in our context, in our culture. The word just means um, to make holy, um, to sanctify. You could pray, you could translate this as sanctify your name. Make your name holy. Um, and so we also think about what does it mean to be holy. And, and the basic sense of holy is, is to be set apart to be set apart toward God, to be uh, regarded, to be um, holy, to be separate, to be sacred, to be venerated. Okay, so so when we pray, hallowed be your name, we're asking God, our Father in heaven, to make his name holy. The immediate question that should arise in our minds is, wait, isn't, isn't God's name already holy? I mean, isn't God's name in itself, completely holy? And yeah, it is. So then what does it mean to pray that his name, that he would make his name holy? I think it has to mean it's something subjective about how people and how creation and how the world and how human beings um, regard God's name, how they relate to God's name. So when we're praying this prayer, Father, hallowed be your name, we're, we're talking about the way that the holiness of God's name in itself would be reflected in the way that we relate to God's name, in our attitude, the attitude that we take up towards God's name. And that God would make, make it be the case that we give to his name the respect and the veneration and the honor that's due to his name as God. Let's think a little bit about the other part, name. Hallowed be your name. Um, What does that mean exactly? What is the name of God? Well, the concept of a name, the 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 Hebrew understanding of a name, um, goes. It's not just a random designation that you use to kind of call somebody something. It it's representation of that person and of all of the qualities and characteristics, their authority, all the things that have been given under which they are known. So it stands for God, for his majesty, for his perfections. So when we revere God's name, it's basically the same as revering him. But we're thinking about the ways that God has been made, has been made known to us. And I want to think a little bit about that from, uh, from the book of Exodus. I'm going to do a few references to Exodus because that's a place where the name of God, the name of the Lord is uh, discussed quite a bit. If we look at Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 to 15, this is Moses and the burning bush. And uh, Moses hears God calling out to him from within this burning bush, this bush that's on fire, but it's not burning up. And um, the voice of God speaking through the bush tells Moses that he's going to go back into Egypt and that um, he's going to play this role in God delivering his people um, from Egypt. But Moses asks a good question. He says, you know, what am I going to do when I go back there and I start talking to these people um, and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord. 
the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. So when we talk about the name of God, and when Jesus was talking about our Father, hallowed be your name, Jesus has this background, this history of how God revealed himself as the mighty deliverer, the savior of his people, the God of the covenant, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. This God, this is who God is and how God revealed himself in that history. A um, couple more verses. Um, Exodus chapter 6, verse 2 and 3. Um, God is talking about the way that he revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he says, um, um, I am the Lord, Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, Yahweh, or YHWH, um, we, we don't actually know 100% how that's supposed to be pronounced. Um, the name of God, right? Uh, the Tetragrammaton, they call it. The four letters, YHWH, which in our English Bibles it gets translated as the Lord with, with small caps um, in the Old Testament, right? Uh, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. So this name, the Lord, Yahweh, he's, he's now making known uh, more in a, a deeper level, more of a level to, to uh, Moses, he talks about that. Um, let's look at one more in Exodus, okay? Um, Exodus chapter um, 34, verse 5 to 7. Um, here, um, God, Moses asked God, I want to see your glory. And God said, I'm going to put you in a cleft of a rock, and I'm going to pass by. I'm not going to let you see my face, but you can see, you can see my back as I go by. Okay, and when God did that with Moses, the Lord passed by and he proclaimed his name. It says that he proclaimed his name. So this is, one of, I think, one of the best places that you look. You want to know about God, who God is. What is he like? What is his name? What does that name represent and encapsulate? And I think the Lord, who declared his own name here, this is very important for us to understand who our God is and what he's like. And he said, declaring his name, the Lord, the Lord, the, com- the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. And just a few verses later, um, uh, in verse 14, he says, do not worship any other God For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. So there's a lot of information there about God, about his name, about who he is, and what his name stands for. But um, I just think it's amazing to think about these traits of God, that our God is the compassionate God. He's the gracious God. He's slow to anger. He abounds in love. He abounds in faithfulness. He's faithful to the covenant. And we look at the history of Israel, and we look at the history of the church, and we look at our own history, and we see unfaithfulness all over the place. And yet we see faithfulness on God's part. God is always faithful to his covenant, the covenant that he made. Forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. This is really good news, that this is who our God is, that this is his name the name of our God. Yet he's also just. He's fair. He's perfectly fair. He's perfectly just. He is the one that we love. This is the God we love. And when we pray, hallowed be your name, we're asking the Father that he would make his name, this name, to be known in the world, to be known more. Because to be hallowed, for us to have the right attitude toward God's name and regard it and set it apart as holy, we have to know his name then we need the knowledge of God. So we're praying for the knowledge of God to be increased, and we're praying for the right attitude toward that that knowledge of God that he reveals. So in light of that, um, I want to think a little bit about how the Father makes his name known. How does the Father make his name known? 
And um, this is something that I think should be should be really a basic thing that we understand as Christians. But um, we we had a Bible study Wednesday, and sometimes it's just not clear. Sometimes the easy answer or the right answer, which we all really know, we don't really kind of recall it, or we don't really take it to heart exactly what that's about. But if I asked you, how do you know God? You know, what would you say? How do you know the Father? How do you know the Father God? People might say, well, I I see God in creation. I see God in other people, I, I see God in this, this way or that way. But the scripture says very clearly that Jesus Christ came to make the Father known and that it's in him that the Father is made known. So let me just give you a couple examples. Um, look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. There, um, this is an awesome, another awesome passage. I'm giving you a bunch of my favorite Bible verses today, so I hope these are encouraging to you. But Matthew 11:27, 27, uh, no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. It states very clearly, how do we know the Father? The Son has to reveal him to us. Jesus has to reveal him. And look at John 1.18, similar kind of verse. It says, No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. This is talking about God the Son. No one has ever seen God the Father. He lives in inaccessible light, the inaccessible light of his glory and brilliance that no one can see without dying. Right, Moses, you can't see my face you can see kind of the back of me after I pass by, but, right? I mean, no one, no one can see God. No one can come to the Father. But God, the one and only Son, makes him known to us, makes known the Father. He is the Word. He is the Word of God. He, communication of God. Let Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. What does it say? Um, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. We could quote, um, a lot more from John's gospel, right? No one comes to the Father except through me. I'm the way and the truth and the life. We know the Father through the Son. And the Son is the exact representation of the Father's being. The Son is the Word, the eternal Word, the eternal speech and communication of God. And that Word became flesh, a man, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, our Lord. That's how we know the Father. That's how he's made known to us. And so Jesus said to his disciples, when you look at me, you're not only looking at me, you see the Father. When you look at me, you see the Father. He said, he and the Father are one. So that's really exciting to me because sometimes when, sometimes we think of a God that's kind of back in the background behind Jesus, and we call that God the Father, and we think that Father is a little bit mysterious and strange and different and we really have no idea and maybe that father is very different or maybe very angry and grumpy and I don't know but the Bible teaches us that we know the father through Jesus to me that's like that's really good news to me when I think about that the father is known through Jesus I think about who Jesus is and what he is like and I'm like thank God that that is how God is like through and through. That's how the Father is. That's how the Son is. That's how the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of the Son. That's who our God is. He's made known through Jesus. He's made known most clearly through the cross of Jesus. So um, let's go to one more verse here. Um, John chapter 12, verse 27, 28. Here, Jesus is just about to go into his passion his suffering, and his death. And um, he's, he's praying, he's considering what he's about to do. And he says, Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? 
Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. Well, that's what I'm saying. When Jesus was talking about his cross and his suffering, his prayer was, Father, glorify your name. And the Father said, yes, I've done it. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm about to do. Glorifying his name, making known his name through the cross of Jesus. And we think about Jesus and the cross and everything that that means. That is who the Father is. The self-giving love, the the, the willingness to, to humble himself, to come down to the very lowest place, to save proud and wretched sinners like us. Out of the depths of his kindness, his willingness to condescend, to come all the way down to the lowest place, to become a sin offering, the one who had no sin, to be made sin on our behalf, to die on the cross, a death of sinners, a death of shame and humiliation and pain, to die. God died. He was buried. If we follow the early Christian creeds, he descended into hell. Jesus went to the lowest place. God, our God, went to the lowest place for us out of his love. That is who our God is. That's how he made his name known of who he is, this God who's our Father. And so Jesus in the Lord's Prayer is teaching us that this name, the name of this God, of this Father, would be made known. And we can think of many areas. Each of these petitions, well, at least the first three for sure, we can ask ourselves, how do we pray this? Father, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Is it just a general prayer? We just prayed out in general, hallowed be your name. Yeah, well, it can be. But we can also pray this prayer over every area. You know, if you don't know how to pray, if you're not sure how to pray or your prayer life is kind of uncertain and vague, and um, how about praying the Lord's Prayer? <laughs> this is kind of, a, it's kind of the point of our, our sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. Um, but you might say, well, practically, how do I do that? Well, every one of these petitions can be prayed over many different areas in many different places. Because Where does God's name need to be hallowed? It needs to be hallowed everywhere, but it can start from us. And we say, God, I want your name to be hallowed. Start it in my heart. Because, God, I often feel like I'm kind of ignorant of you. Like I'm not really that clear about the knowledge of you, of who you are. And even when I am, I'm not always holding it in the utmost reverence like I know that I should. And I think if we're honest of ourselves and we think of our own heart, how about we pray that first? Hallowed be your name, Father, in my heart, in my thoughts, in my mind, in my relationships with other people. Hallowed be your name. May your name be known. May your glory be revealed. This great name that you have. And then we can pray it about our family members. We can pray it about our family relationships. We can pray for our friends. We can pray for the city that we live in. We can pray for the neighborhood or the street that you're on. Hallowed be your name in this street. Hallowed be your name in this neighborhood, Father. Hallowed be your name in the city, Waterloo. Hallowed be your name in Ontario, in Canada, in North America, in this world, on planet Earth, in my workplace, in my school, in the government, in the hospitals, in the prisons, in the marketplace, in the world of art, you could pray for, you could have a great time of prayer for an hour and just pray, hallowed be your name, Father, over these different areas. And you know what? That would be a very effective and productive prayer time. So we think that prayer is a waste of time. And we think in particular, like we think the Lord's for something you just kind of rattle off. I mean, you can just pray it. It's okay. But you can also go really deep in the Lord's prayer. Think of all areas in our world where God's name is not being hallowed, where God's name is not known, or, you know, it maybe it was known, but it's been rejected, and, and the attitude that we have, and the blaspheming of God's name, and the desecration of God's name, 
in many forms, locally, openly, people who are hostile to God, who are uh, advocating atheism, who openly uh, reject God and, and seek to suppress the knowledge of God openly, or the many ways that people um, suppress the knowledge of God not so openly, maybe through idolatry, through various forms of idolatry and false forms of worship and religion that, that we engage in as human beings, whether that's Christian or non-Christian religious idolatry. Anything that sets its up, itself up against the true knowledge of God is a place where there is a stronghold of the enemy where the howling of God's name needs to be prayed for and broken in. And that's the root. Why is it centrally important beyond all other things? I would say that it is. I think that's why Jesus put this first as the first thing that we ask for. For our Father's name to be hallowed. Why is that so important? Let's just say a few things about this. Um, Romans chapter 1, verse um, 21. It says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. When Paul, Romans, and Romans is the place where Paul most systematically lays out the gospel, he is tracing out the roots of all of the evil in our society, in our world. And where does it originate? Where does it start? It starts in the ignorance of God. It's a willful ignorance of God. Although they knew God, in some sense, they refused to glorify Him as God or give thanks to Him. So what happened? Their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Their thought world became futile. Their emotions became dark. The innermost area of the tree became rotten and corrupt and then all of its fruit that gets produced is tainted by that rottenness and corruption. And it overflows to all of society. Paul lays it out in Romans 1, 29-32. He talks... This is just a summary. It's not meant to be exhaustive. But what happened, right? Uh, They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They're gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. Okay, we could go on and on. Paul lays it out here. But this all originates. All of the, the evil and the tragedy that we see in our society, in our world today, which is a lot. I don't know about you, but I... I feel really discouraged and sad a lot of the time these days when I think about many forms of manifestations of evil and violence and corruption and greed in our world, in our society, in myself, in all around. It's very discouraging sometimes. But we can see here that there's a root to it. And the root is that people don't know God properly as he should be, and they don't honor his name properly as is due to his name. And so when Jesus gave us this petition, Father, make your name to be holy. Make your name to be set apart in our hearts, in the hearts of people. He's he's getting right to the root of the whole thing, of the whole issue. It's an antidote, you know? And it's it's not so much that we have the power and capacity to make God's name holy. We're praying for him to do it. And that's why I say this is, this is, a very effective prayer. How could it not be an effective prayer to pray this prayer when it's what Jesus told us to pray? Right? Jesus isn't like, hey, you know, pray. Here's this prayer I want you to pray. And by the way, God probably won't, it's kind of vague and God probably won't answer it. Just really just pray for something else that you care about more. The Lord will answer this prayer when we pray it. The Lord will answer this prayer. I feel very assured just from everything that I know about the Bible that if we pray this prayer, the Lord will hear it and will answer and will move, which is really exciting because I want my prayer life to be effective. I don't know about you. I don't want to pray a bunch of vague things that aren't aren't likely to come to pass. So that's one of the main take-homes that I want to encourage you today is is to pray. Pray for this prayer. (laughs) Pray this prayer. Pray the Lord's Prayer. Why is it so important that God's name be known? One of the main uh, visions of the kingdom of God, of the glory and beauty of God, and of the reign of the Messiah is from 11, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9 to 10. Well, it's more, more than that, but I'm just focusing on that part. And 
This is another one of my favorite Bible verses. I love this Bible verse. And I feel like it's very related to what we're talking about today. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious. And this connects, I think, very meaningfully to what Joshua was sharing earlier today with us. Um, But why would they neither harm nor destroy anymore? Why? Because the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. His name will be known all across. How do the waters cover the seas? It's such an interesting expression, right? How... How do the waters cover the seas? Well, they pre- I mean, pretty much comprehensively, that's what a sea is. It's water, right? So just like that, the knowledge of the Lord will fill the earth, will flood through the entire earth, the knowledge of who God really is. And people will not harm nor destroy any longer when the knowledge of God is like that, it's full of filling the whole earth. Um, so beyond that, I basically just wanted to share, um, that because our prayer is our life and our life is our prayer, what we really pray for, what we really cry out to God for, what really after God about, that will also be what we live, what priorities we live according to. So I want to ask, what are your priorities in life? If you thought about, do you live consciously with priorities, with sort of like goals? you have a list? Like, these are my goals. These are my priorities in my life. This is what I'm doing, what I'm after. We all have goals, whether we consciously reflect about them or not. I mean, we live out and we act according to what goals we have. We need to make this priority of Jesus the top of our list of our goals, of our life, of how we live. Lord, I want to live. I want to live this prayer. I pray this prayer and I live this prayer. Hallowed be your name, Father. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the, one, it's the one thing needed. How can we do that practically? How can we live, hallowed be your name, our Father, hallowed be your name? I think there's many things that can be said. I'm not going to say much more, but I have a few things briefly, and I might sound like a totally broken record because this is kind of what I, I say this a lot. But I think, first of all, if you want to live your life in such a way that our Father in heaven's name is hallowed in your life and through you, you first should be loved by this Father. You have to be loved by Him. You have to let Him love you. You have to remain in Him. Remain in His love. Jesus said, remain in me. And my words remain in you, and you will bear much fruit. And this is to my Father's glory. But he said, without, without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. So we could have all kinds of agendas and ideas and get really excited about all these different causes and things that we want to jump into and accomplish. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. So it has to start from him. It has to start from the place of being filled of remaining him, remaining in his love. And as we remain in his love, what happens is that we start to love God because we go, oh my God, God, you love me. You love me like that. You love me with the eternal glory and fullness of your being. You love me the way that you love your son, Jesus. That's how you love me. We say, well, God, okay. I think I love you too. <laughs> if, that's, if that's what you're like, I think I love you too. And then our heart gets tender toward God and we get softened. And, and then we love God. And I was just thinking as I prepared the sermon of when I was in high school, I played football for a year. I was not a good football player. But I played on this team. Our team sucked. <laughs> it was really bad. But we had this coach. And when we would go on the field, he would, he would shout. He would shout this saying. He had this saying, it was reckless abandon. That's what, that's what he would shout. You know, we'd be on the field and he'd be like, Reckless abandon! Reckless abandon! And I was like, that's how, that's how you should love God. 
That's how we should be in God's love and how we should love God, with reckless abandon. Reckless abandon. That's how we live out the hallowing of God's name, is we, we let him love us, we receive his love, we're filled up by him, and then we start to move back. We love him with the love that he puts in us, and we start to love one another as Jesus loved us. And he said, this is my command, that you love one another as I have loved you. No greater love has any person than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. So we give our life. We give our life for our friends. We give our life for, for God's people in love. That's, that's, how, that's the, I think, an essence. Now, there's so many things to say to make that more concrete. Um, um, I think spiritual gifts is a big part of it. We've been talking about spiritual gifts this year in our church. Mm-hmm. That we would we we give ourselves to cultivate the things that God has put on our heart because we know that those are all to be contributed to the common good for the building up of the body, and that's a way that we we give our love to God by doing that. There's many other things. Okay, uh, that's all. That's all I'm going to share today. So, all right, let's let's do the Lord's prayer. Well, how about we just say the Lord's prayer together? Okay, we're going to be doing this for several more weeks, at least up to Christmas. Um, I hope this is helping you. I hope this, this makes it more alive to you as you pray the Lord's Prayer, as you let it, really, what am I praying about? What is this about? This is really important. Okay? Um, so if we can have Matthew 6, verse 9 to uh, 13 up here. You guys want to stand up to say this? Just let's all stand before the Lord to say this prayer. Okay? Uh, we'll just start from our, okay? Let's go. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Let me say a prayer to conclude. Our Father in heaven, we love your name. Lord, as we, as we sang today, the name of God, Yahweh, the Chismoy the glorious one, the great and compassionate God. Father, you are the source of all good. Every good thing comes from you. And Father, we repent that we have been so ignorant of your name and that we have not held your name with the reverence that is due to it in our lives. We have not done that personally. We have not done that as a church. We have not done that as a people, a uh, people. Uh, in this city, Lord, we repent and we pray this prayer that Jesus gave us. Father, hallowed be your name. Make your name to be hallowed in our hearts, O Lord. Have mercy on me, God. Make your name to be hallowed in my heart, as is due your name. Father, we cannot do this ourselves. We need you. We need your revelation. We need you to move by your spirit. And we pray and we cry out with confidence in the name of Jesus that this will be done for us, God. And we pray your name. We pray that your name would be would fill the earth. The knowledge of you would fill the earth. Would fill the earth, every part. Lord, as you put every issue of darkness on our hearts this week, every area of discouragement and brokenness that we encounter in our relationships, every place where there's darkness, let us pray that your name would be hallowed there and let us see you moving, Lord, and make your name to be known. Make your name to be known as it is, Father. Please just make this the driving heart and and passion of our lives as it was of Jesus. And yeah, God, we just remember once again the youths who are going to Israel. And God, I just bless them with with this word of Jesus as they go to the land of Israel, um, God, and the the land and the people that you chose to associate your name with, um, God, and that we were grafted in. And God, just that your name would be hallowed mightily in the trip. And that your name would be hallowed over each of our lives and our workplaces, God. Thank you that in our weakness you are strong. Thank you that you've told us what we can do about our weakness, that we can pray to you, Father, and trust that you will do it. So, uh, yeah, we just give you thanks, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.